uh, you know, Ryan's career is that he he performs, they perform on Saturday nights, and he drive, he's driven in from a lot of distances, but he can't always get back here. And that's the case, not just today, but the next two Sundays. And the subs that I normally get are not available the next two Sundays either, so just remember that. All right, if you would stand to your feet as we read Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is about being thirsty for God. Now that is kind of the theme today, because we're going to be in the book of Hosea today. And so the question as you read this this morning, as uh, the beginning of our worship, since we're not singing, we're, we're singing a song this, our psalm this morning, are you thirsty for God? Let's read this together, uh, beginning in verse 1, whatever, no matter what translation you have, no matter what language you have, let's read this together, all of Psalm 42, all 11 verses. And the, if you're in the King James, the word for heart, that's deer. So you might have heard that song as the deer panted for water, so my soul thirsts for God. So heart is deer, so let's read it that way. As the deer pants after the water, Brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in thee, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude, they kept holy day. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of the countenance. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermans, from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water source. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is your God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Lord Jesus, today I pray that as we uh, begin our worship time and our time to study your word. I pray that you will impress us, press upon us today. Number one, how much you love us. And number two, how much it breaks your heart when we don't return that love. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Turn over to the book of Hosea. We continue to preach <clears throat> through the Bible. I don't know, uh, but if by the time you guys get your new pastor on board, I don't know if I'll make it all the way through the book of Revelation, but I believe we'll make it all the way through the Old Testament, and that's a pretty major task. We're in the book of Hosea today, and Hosea was uh, a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah with the country of Judah, and uh, he preached to both Israel, the northern kingdom, and to Judah, the southern kingdom. And he preached basically and wrote this book during the time about 760 B.C. to 710 B.C. And that was a time that the Assyrians first attacked uh, Israel. Now, in the first attack on Israel, uh, they were not successful in destroying the country. In the second attack, uh, which hasn't occurred yet, they're going to destroy the nation Israel. And what they would do in those days, they would take all the people <clears throat> out of their conquered countries and take them to other countries. So when you see the Jews in England and Europe and Russia and Africa and Persia and India, when you see Jews all over the world, it's because that when the Assyrians defeated Israel, they took all those Jews and spread them out all over their kingdom and over the kingdoms of the world. And that's how Israel was dispersed. The book has a bunch of different themes, basically three different themes in it. But here's the main theme. If you read the book of Hosea, here's what you're going to hear out of the book of Hosea. 
you're going to hear the broken heart of God. You're going to hear his heart has been broken because she who he loved, being the nation Israel, has turned aside uh, to other gods. And he's broken hearted. I don't know, I hope none of you have ever been through uh, a divorce. I hope none of you have ever been through any marital problems. But if you've ever been through anything where somebody that you love has broken your heart, then you'll understand the book of Hosea. Because when you read the book of Hosea, you feel, as you read through there, just reading through, you feel the broken heart of God and how much He is in pain by Israel turning against Him. And how does that translate into our sermon today? It translates into our sermon today because <clears throat> Jesus saves us and once we are saved, we become His. And Jesus wants to be number two in our life? No. He wants to be number one in our life. And so when you remember, Jesus is God. So when you hear the, and feel the broken heart of God in the book of Hosea, understand that when we fail to make Jesus number one in our heart, in our life, it breaks His heart. It doesn't just anger Him, it breaks His heart when we don't return His love, the love that He has poured out upon us and continues to pour out upon us. So if you're ready to study the book of Hosea, say Amen. Here we come. We're going to look first at <clears throat> chapter 1, and we're going to begin in, and begin in verse 2. In the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto you a wife of har harlotry, and children of harlotry, uh, for the land has committed great harlotry, departing from the Lord. So, <clears throat> in those days, being a prophet of God was a much more difficult thing than modern day preachers or modern day evangelists because when the Lord wanted Hosea to preach the understanding of how much God was hurt and how much God suffered from Israel's action, in order to impress that upon Hosea, what did God do? God told Hosea, marry this woman, but she is to be a harlot. She is to be an unfaithful woman. She is to be a prostitute. So in other words, God's marriage advice to Hosea, in order to enhance his preaching, to be able to communicate God's suffering to the people of Israel, he told Hosea to marry a prostitute. Gomer was a prostitute. So just keep that in mind. Then Hosea had a son. <laughs> and God said, I want you to name your son, in verse 4 there, Jezreel. Jezreel. Everybody say Jezreel. Jezreel, the word Je Jezreel, and the name Jezreel means place of slaughter. Now what's going to happen here, the reason that Amos, uh, that Hosea's firstborn uh, son is named Jezreel is because in just a few short years, Israel is going to be destroyed in battle in the valley of Jezreel. Who has ever heard of Jezreel? The valley of Jezreel is where in the final days, the valley of Armageddon will be fought. So this word, this name that God gave to Hosea's firstborn son has multiple meanings. It means that Jezreel is where Israel would be destroyed by the Assyrians in the valley of Jezreel. But it also looks forward to the day, and we'll read about that here when we get to verse 10. It looks forward to the day when God will defeat the enemies of Israel and restore Israel to the land in the valley of Je Jezreel at the great battle of Armageddon. Let's go on. Verse uh, 6. And she conceived again and bore a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name uh, Lo Ruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. And so his next child was a girl, Lo Ruhama, and God said, Call her Lo Ruhama, because that means I will have no mercy. In other words, God is saying to Israel, Because of your unfaithfulness, I will have no mercy. Go on to verse uh, 8 now. Now when she had weaned Lorahama, she conceived and bore a son. And then God said, call his name Loami, uh, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So in other words, <clears throat> on the next child that was born, every one of these children had a name that meant something that the Lord was going to do to Israel. 
the next one was is that for a period of time the children of Israel would cease to be the children of God they would not be the children of God let's go on now but <clears throat> understand this even though God was broken hearted because of the way Israel had acted toward him and the unfaithfulness that Israel had acted toward him understand this God never ceased to love Israel why is that important to us today as believers in Christ because we're the bride of Christ amen if you're a believer in Jesus Christ you're born again we're a bride of Christ amen but how many of us at different times in our life and perhaps even right now have cease to make Jesus number one in our life. How many times have we turned away from the love of Jesus and turned to the love of other, other things? How much time do we spend during the week thinking about Jesus and meditating on that wonderful love relationship that Christ has with us and we spend all of our time thinking of other things? I know that happens to me. I don't know if it happens to you, but it does happen to me. And I get caught up in other things. Sometimes even church people who are so involved in church like it says over in Revelation chapter 2 uh, in the, uh, Jesus' letter to the Ephesians, sometimes even church people are so involved in church, they abandon their first love. Because our first love always needs to be Jesus. Amen? But even though sometimes we fail to make Jesus number one, and even though sometimes Jesus will chastise us to bring us back into fellowship with Him, He never, ever ceases to love us. Understand that. Jesus may get upset with us. Jesus may chastise us. Jesus may not like what we're doing. He doesn't condone when we sin. He doesn't condone bad behavior. But He never, ever ceases to love us. Ever. Because listen, the evidence of that is here in verse 10. Yea, the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them you are not my people then it shall be said unto them you are the sons of the living God then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head and of course that's going to be the Messiah in the millennial kingdom and they shall come up out of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel there's that word again Jezreel that great shall be the day of Jezreel. That will be the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is when Jesus will come with the saints to deliver Israel from the nations. That's the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Jezreel. Let's go on. We can talk a lot about that, but we're not going to do that. So you can see, even in the midst of the Lord's anger and in the midst of His pain and suffering over Israel's actions toward Him, Israel's adulterous actions toward Him, because now think about this. Anytime we put anything in our life and we make that more important to us than Jesus, that makes us like an adulterous wife. Just like that's what Israel was. Israel had followed after false gods. Israel had followed after gold and silver. They had put a lot of things above their relationship with Jesus. So the question for us today was, as Christians, are we putting things number one in our life above our relationship with Jesus. If we are, that's how God sees us. So what does God do to bring us back? We're going to read a couple of verses of this in chapter 2. Chapter 2, uh, verse 2. Contend with your mother. Now he is, God is speaking to the children, the oldest son, and I mean the youngest son, and to Ruhama. <clears throat> Contend with your mother, Gomer, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her harlotry out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And it goes on through uh, uh, verse 13 there saying what God is going to do to Israel. So what is God doing to Israel? God is punishing Israel. A better word from that, and we talked about this about four or five Sundays ago, in the book of Lamentations, God is chastising Israel. We don't hear that word much anymore in church. We don't hear the word chastisement. Uh, it literally means to spank. And over in Hebrews chapter 12, we studied about four or five weeks ago that when the Lord spanks us, who's ever been spanked by the Lord other than me? 
Yeah, you ever been spanked by the Lord or thumped really good by the Lord? I've been thumped a bunch of times in my life. That's what my dad used to do. My dad was strong as an ox. And when I would do something wrong, he wouldn't spank me, but he'd take that finger and he'd pop me. And my gosh, I would almost rather him spank me than that. He, you know, he would thump me good. Sometimes on the head, sometimes in other places, but he would thump me pretty good. And so the Lord has thumped me many times. But why does the Lord do that? It says, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that when the Lord spanks us, when the Lord chastises us, He doesn't do that just to hurt us. If you have children, you already know this. If you don't have children, you're going to learn this. If you have a child and you don't spank that child, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't love that child. Now, this nonsense today that you shouldn't punish a child too much or spank a child or any of that, that is, let's, how can I say this? That is just straight from the pit of hell. Because that's nonsense. If you don't spank a child, how will the child know that he needs to correct his actions? Spanking is for correction. It's not to destroy. It's not to even to punish. It's for correction. And so when the Lord chastises us, He's trying to correct us. He's trying to rescue us. My favorite verse in the Bible is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. God knows how to rescue the godly out of their temptations. God knows how to rescue the godly out of their temptations. When we get caught up in a sin, when we get caught up in something that takes our attention off God, when we get caught up in something that could ruin our life, don't you want our loving Heavenly Father to intervene in your life to save us from that? When you see a child wander into the street and nothing happens, do you just pat them on the head and say, well, you're lucky today? Is that what you say to them? No, you wear their britches out and you explain to them that they're not to go outside that front door again without you. And you impress upon their little brains that what happens in the street will kill them. What I tell my children when they were growing up, we'd walk across the parking lot. I was always scared to death that they'd get loose and get behind a car that was backing out of a parking place. So I would show up the greasy spots at the pavement on the parking lot, and I would say that is where a child got loose from their parent and got run over by a car. And they would say, oh my gosh. And even to this day, my kids walk around the greasy spots on the parking lot because they're scared to death of what might happen to them in the park, but they've never forgot that. That's what God wants us to do. When God spanks us, we should not say, God, quit spanking me. We should say, praise you, God, that you love me. Because God doesn't spank those that are not His. He doesn't spank people outside of that covenant relationship that we have with Him through Jesus. He only spanks His children. You don't go to a mall and spank another kid's child, even though you may feel like doing that sometime. Lord, woman, get hold of your children. You know, have you ever, have you ever seen that? Or, you know, and uh, by the way, if you haven't been a parent yet, the most critical place in the world that you need to hope your children act nice is when you're in the grocery store or in the mall. Because invariably, when they have a meltdown, it'll be in the grocery store or in the mall. And when they do, everybody will look at you and say, Lord, woman, can't you get hold of your children? Because they'll be just doing something crazy and you'll just leave your buggy. You won't even get your groceries and just leave the store because it's just too rough. Anyhow, that's enough marriage counseling for the day. Now in verse 14, the Lord begins to explain to Israel that even though he's upset with Israel, that he hasn't forgotten it. And that... Their relationship will see even better days. Because he says here in verse 14, he says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly unto her. And I will give her her vineyards and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, says the Lord, that thou shalt call, not to call me Ishi. And Ishi means husband. And thou shalt no more call me Bailey, which means Lord. So the relationship with Israel in the last days, after the battle of Jezreel, the battle of Armageddon, in the millennial kingdom time, God is promising that someday 
even though now they're going to be spread all over the universe, basically, that someday that's all going to change. And, the, and all the promises that God has made to Israel in the Bible will come true again. And that the wife of God, which is Israel, by the way, in, in Isaiah chapter 52, 56 and Isaiah chapter 62, it says clearly that the wife of God is Israel. In the New Testament, the bride of Christ is who? It's us, the church. Two special relationships, and those relationships are given not because there's anything unusual about them, just so that we understand how much Jesus loves us, how much God loves the nation Israel. And He has promised that Israel will be brought back into fellowship in the last days. Now in chapter 3, we get a picture of the love of Jesus for each of us from the cross. Understand that all of us and all of mankind, we are exceedingly sinful and wicked. And even after we've been saved and we've been born again in, in our soul and we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, our bodies still are filled with that same sin and that same wickedness. And we have that, that's why we have that constant struggle as a believer between our perfected soul and our imperfect body. But mankind, apart from people who are born again, is exceedingly sinful and wicked, and mankind has continually gone after sin. That's why when you, now listen now, if you're listening, say amen. That's why when you look at society today, especially in the United States, but not just in the United States, you see a society that is hell-melling or, or plummeting or whatever word you want to use towards destruction. Can you see it as a believer in Christ? I can see it clearly. And you should be able to see it clearly. But those who are plummeting to destruction do not see it clearly. So <clears throat> before Jesus came and died on the cross for us, that's where we were. Plummeting to destruction exceedingly sinful, exceedingly rebellious against God. And so, here's a picture that, uh, that God gives us that is one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible of what Jesus has done for us. And God uses, once again, He uses Hosea and Gomer. Here it goes. For, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, have a love, love a woman beloved of her friend, Yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and have cakes of raisins. So I bought her for I bought her for myself for fifteen pieces of silver and for a homer and a half of barley. And I said to her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot. And thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, that's Jesus by the way, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Look at the picture. Gomer is not just a prostitute. She's a slave. And so God tells Hosea, I want you to go buy a wife. And I want you to go to the slave market. And not only do I want you to pick out a woman that you can buy from the slave market, but I want you to pick a woman who's a, prost a known prostitute who is a slave. So listen, Hosea went to the slave market and for 15 pieces of silver... For 15 pieces of silver, he purchased Gomer to be his wife. He selected not the best woman there. In fact, if he was going to select the perfect wife, he wouldn't have gone to the slave market. He selected a woman who was a slave and in bondage not only to slavery, but to her sins. And God said, I want you to go and pay 15 shekels of silver. What is that? When you go and you pay something for something, what are you doing? You're redeeming. This is a perfect picture 
of God's redemption of us. We're going to look at Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, real good memory verse, by the way. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, well, let's pick it up at verse 13. It says, <clears throat> Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a people of His own desirous of good works. So you see, what that means is, is that Jesus on the cross paid the penalty for my sins. Let's all say that. Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. Let's all say that. Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. He redeemed us. He purchased us. Why did He purchase us? Because He loves us. He chose us. It's not just a random thing. Jesus died on the cross for me. He paid the sins. He paid the price for my sins for me. He redeemed me unto Himself. He wanted me for Himself. He wants you for Himself. That's why the church is called not just the body of Christ, but we're also called the bride of Christ. To understand what Jesus is after, look at uh, Matthew 10, 37. A very, very difficult passage of Scripture. <clears throat> but it gives you a picture of what Jesus is after. Jesus says to us, He that loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I love you so much that I who am God came down as a man, the God-man, and died on the cross for one purpose and one purpose only, to save my bride. And now I've saved you so that you can be my bride. Jesus expects, has made us number one. We are His number one object of love. The number one object of Jesus' love is me and you. We are the object of Jesus' love. Jesus is love because God is love. That's the very nature of God, the very nature of Jesus. And the object of that love is you and me. And so since Jesus has made us the object of His love, He expects us to make Him the object of our love. You say, does that mean I'm not supposed to love my mom and dad? No. But what Jesus is saying is, is that our love for our mom and dad, our love for our children, is supposed to seem like no love whatsoever compared to our love for Jesus. Now, it's real easy to say that, isn't it? But we have a lot of distractions. Our children, we love our children desperately. We would do anything for our children. We would, if we did see our child walk into the street and a car was coming, we would step in front of that car in order to save our child, amen? But our love for Christ, listen now, but our love for Christ must be greater than that. Not just in service, not just in doing good works. Our love for Christ needs to be greater than anything else in our life. And so the way we can tell where our love is is where we spend our time. You know, if you've been married very long at all, at some point in time, your wife will have said to me, you don't talk to me anymore. Marjorie just looked at John. So I... <laughs> At some point in time, if you've been married long enough, your wife eventually is going to... You know, I don't think I ever heard a husband turning to their wives and saying, hey, you just don't talk to me anymore. It's usually the wife turning to the husband saying, you just don't talk to me anymore. <clears throat> and they say that because they're trying to make the point that if you're not talking to me anymore, maybe you don't love me anymore. And then men will say something cool like, that. I love you, baby, or whatever. You know, some men will say something cool like that. Uh, and, then, and then the wives who have gone to wife school and husbands have not been to a husband school, the, the wives will say, well, if you really love me, you would show me instead of just telling me. 
Now, every wife in this room has said that at one time or another. Uh, I know you have. You can't deny it. I know you've said it. And you're right. When you really love someone, you show it. You don't just say it. Now, you need to say it, too. But you show it. You demonstrate it with your actions. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? Amen? But we demonstrate our love for Christ by demonstrating it to Him. Not just me telling you I love Jesus. Not just you telling me you love Jesus. We demonstrate our love for Christ by demonstrating our love to Him. How do we do that? By spending time with Him. With him. We spend time with Jesus. We spend time with Jesus in meditation. We spend time with Jesus in prayer. We spend time with Jesus in the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Where do you spend your most time? With Jesus? Or with email, text, Facebook, those other things that I I don't even know about, to be honest with you. Where do you spend all your time? Yeah, I understand that we all work and that we're all covered up with emails all day long. I understand that. We have to do that. That's work. We have to do that. There's no, that's, that's, that's the thing. But where do you spend all your time? Where do you spend all your thoughts? Now, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, <clears throat> since I went into business many, many, many years ago, I've, I've told my kids, I've told everybody that works for me, you have to think until it hurts, which means you think about everything all the time. You you think about this, and you think about this worker, and that worker, and then this piece of material, and that piece of material, and what you've got to do here, and what you've got to do there, and how you're going to pay this bill, and how you can think all the time. But when you think all the time, you have a tendency to not think about Jesus. Above all of that, there needs to be Jesus. In other words, the only way I can say this is that while you're thinking about all these things and you're planning all these things and you're desiring all these things, let Jesus remain uppermost in your thoughts. When you're trying to make decisions in your life, let Jesus be uppermost in your thoughts. Well, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. I'm going to take this job. I'm going to take that job. I'm going to marry this person. God will let Jesus be uppermost in your thoughts. The more time that you spend with Christ, <clears throat> away from all those other things that claim distraction, the closer you're going to feel to Jesus. Here, I'm going to tell you something, a little secret. <clears throat> all pastors, including me, are not always close to Jesus. Why? Because what we're thinking about I thought about this sermon all week long. I knew what I was going to preach. <clears throat> After I finished reading through Hosea on Monday, I knew exactly what I was going to preach. I saw, I saw and felt the heartbreak of God all week long. I knew exactly what I was going to preach today. And then it began to convict me that I wasn't as close to Jesus as I had been in the past. That's what Jesus tells us over Revelation chapter 2 to the church of the Ephesians. You have learned, left your first love. Straighten up. Get back to your first love. Now, he didn't say straighten up, but that's basically, he said repent. That's what he said. So I got a challenge for me, and I got a challenge for you this week. Let's this week make sure that no matter what our week is going to be, you may have an easy week, you may have a tough week, You may have a busy week. You may have a slack week. I don't know what your week is. You don't know what my week is. But let's covenant with one another to make Jesus number one this week. So we come back next week and say, you know, Pastor, in everything that I did this week, I tried to make Jesus number one. You can be sitting there typing on your computer. You can be there working on your computer. You can be out in the car driving, doing this, doing that. You can be on the phone talking to people. You can still make Jesus Number one. You can do it. Think about this. Think about a time in your life if Jesus is not number one in your life right now. He may be, he may not. Think about a time when he was. 
And that's what Jesus tells us in to the letter to the church of the Ephesians. Repent and return to the former things. Return to those days when Jesus was number one. You will be more content as a believer. Your soul will be filled up with the presence of God. That's what David was saying in Psalm 42. He had lost his closeness to God. And he was thirsting for God's presence. Remember, in each one of us there is a soul. And the only thing that can satisfy our soul is not things, not even people. The only thing that can satisfy our soul is God. So Jesus came to save our souls so that we could be filled up with God. We have that right. We have that opportunity. We can be filled with the presence of God 24-7 if we surrender to it. So are you thirsty for God? Are you thirsty for God the way the deer is thirsty for water? That's where we need to be. We need to have a thirst for everything that has to do with Jesus. Father, I thank you for the day. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me. And I pray for the congregation to forgive us when we don't make you number one in our lives. I pray this week, Lord, that with everything going on in our lives, that all week long, we will focus upon you. All week long, we will meditate upon you. We will meditate upon your word. We will meditate upon you. In our prayer time, we will seek to get close to you. We'll seek to get close to feel your presence in our prayers this week, Lord. I pray that you would help us with that, Lord. I pray that you would convict us that we must do that in order to be pleasing to you. Jesus, a lot of times we do leave you as our first love. And forgive us for that. But Lord, help us to return to that. Help us to repent today and turn back to the times when you were the number one thing in our life. And help us this week, Lord, to be saved. Jesus is number one in our life. Not just say it, but to demonstrate it to you. Jesus, we love you and we praise your holy name. Amen. Let's all stand up. We don't have music today, so we're not going to be doing it.